Hello, welcome to the Freebus UBI online workshop series. My name is Carl Weiderquist. I'll be your host. And today, our first presentation is by Mikhail Bowmeyer, who is the head of Grundein Komen, the founder and director of Mein Grundein Komen, which, which is German for My Basic Income, which started with a small effort to get to get one basic income to one randomly chosen person in Germany out of thousands of applicants. And now has grown to uh, a, a very large UBI experiment with hundreds of participants and maybe expanding to uh, hundreds more. And, uh, uh, and, and Mikhail is here today to tell us about what we've learned so far from the program and what we'll be learning, likely to learn from it in the future. Mikhail? Thank you very much, Carl. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, let me get started then. Um, I'm gonna say a few words about our project uh, here in Berlin, Germany, and um, then speak Michael, about- Michael, just a, just a sec. Um, you are in the presenter mode, so we can see your presenting mode and uh, not the whole slide. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, so I do it again. Um, thank you. Now I think, I think the pro no the, the problem is with your uh, the problem is not with your your Zoom program but with the other program you're using the uh, um, what program is that um, whatever you're using to project it um, you need to you need to press I think that green button in the upper left hand corner of that thing. Um, you're not seeing uh, the big slide we want to know. We're seeing what, what we're seeing. Um, we're not. It doesn't take up the full screen. Okay. It takes up only a portion of the screen. Okay, that's weird. It, it just worked though. Um, okay. There you go. Now you got it. Um, now you got it. All right. All right. Cool. Now let's go. Um, yeah, Carl kind of said it already. This is um, a story behind the whole project. Um, I was lucky enough to have kind of a passive income um, eight years ago um, that kind of felt like uh, having my own basic income and uh, starting with this experience. Um, I wanted to find out uh, if this would actually apply to everyone, what happened to me there. And of course, uh, you need money to find out what a UBI does to you. So the idea was to crowdfund the money. And what started out, out as a yeah, one-time project turned out to be a huge thing. Now um, we've raised uh, a lot of money <laughs> over the past eight years, over 14 million euros, and redistributed it um, to 1,100 people who have ever since received uh, one year of basic income. That means in our case, 1,000 euros each month for 12 months. Um, we have an online platform with 3.5 million users and um, uh, uh, 200,000 monthly donors who um, don't have to donate to participate, but who are doing it. Um, yeah, nobody knows why, <laughs> because they want to do it. Um, and they're donating almost 1 million euros a month. So um, each month we are able to do a raffle here on this Wheel of Fortune that you see in the picture and um, have new people uh, try a year of UBI. Um, it's very simple. It's free for everyone to join, also for people from other countries, for babies, um, for elderly people. So really every human being who has access to a computer somehow. Um, and we have a team of 37 people um, uh, a very radical way of self-organized work that we're doing, but that's a different topic. And we have our office here in Berlin. Um, our project has basically been a very successful media campaign in the past eight years. On average, we have seven media publications every day. Um, we um, have with this, we have doubled the uh, media attention in Germany. When you compare to before our project was started, there was only 
have as much um, media attention concerning basic income. We've been writing a book about the stories that the people had um, with the money and um, even made it to the biggest TV show, Anne Will, um, with our topic. Um, and why did this work? Because um, I think we always had good stories to tell. Um, giving random people money is always interesting for media because it tells real world stories that people can relate to. Um, it's relevant, it's political, but it's also not too difficult. And I think it was the first time in the German debate that uh, there was not this moral philosophical debate, but also uh, yeah, a debate of feelings, uh, uh, stories that you could relate to. And I think this is the reason for our success so far. So obviously the question is, what did we find out in the past eight years? At first, I have to say there was no um, scientific research in the past years. Um, all we did was storytelling. We were visiting the people. We we're talking to everyone on the phone who's winning. And um, it's very different people. As I said, babies to elderly people, poor, rich, left, right. We have like pretty much everyone on our platform. And um, interesting though, that they all say pretty much the same. I think the most said sentence is, I sleep better and um, stress reduction. And um, yeah, that has been said by pretty much everyone, no matter if they're about to um, get a million from their parents or if they are living on the street. Um, of course, the details were different, but um, what we found really surprising is that it's the UBI money seemed to have an effect even on the people who would need the money. And this empowerment effect um, that, I don't know, can be described as more self-efficacy, more autonomy, more having the freedom of deciding, having more locus of control, all these kinds of things that we heard a lot. And what seems to be really um, hopeful is that people kind of moved, I don't know how else to say it because it's so difficult to catch. They moved from ego to eco. They were paying and they had more, seems like they had more mental capacity um, because they had a bigger feeling of security now. Now they had, had the mental capacity to, own, to also look at others, to do voluntary work, to um, be more empathetic. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, what we did not find, uh, well, of course, that's not so much uh, so obvious, but we didn't find uh, this laziness thing. Uh, we had a lot of people around, I would say, 5% who did change the job. Many of them wanted to change the job anyway. And now they um, uh, usually found jobs where they that fit better to them and they are much happier with work now, much more motivated. Uh, people who used to be really annoyed by their jobs now uh, feel happier at work because now as they had to go, um, they uh, it feels better to stay. Um, that was actually a very interesting fact. Also, we have a lot of people who said, once I win, I will quit my job. Um, I will get divorced from my annoying husband. But then once they actually did have the money, they could now, you know, they had a better position to uh, negotiate. And usually they stayed with their boss or their husband. So the big fear of um, everything changed not apply. Um, when you just look on the paper, not so much changed for, for the vast majority of the people in our, um, in our game. Um, but people said they're feeling better and taking better decisions. But uh, as you might say, um, these are just a whole bunch of stories. Uh, we might have a strong interview or Hathrone effect, um, people telling us what we want to hear. And um, so we got kind of um, yeah, nervous and we wanted to find out what, what really happens to the people. And this is um, why we started our pilot project um, last summer. And I'm going to show you a one minute video um, that I think explains um, the tonality of our project the best. I'm going to start it and I hope the sound works. Let's find out. Wow, a whole lot going on. Faster and faster. More and more. And what about us? 
right in the middle. Stress and burnout have become part of our everyday life, but is there no alternative? Can we succeed in ensuring that civilization not only has a heart for progress, but also for us humans? And wouldn't it be great if everyone who does a good job would get more than just praise? Our society is becoming increasingly divided, but what can we do against this new division of Germany? Does the far right become more and more extreme? Do we have anything to counteract populism? And is there perhaps a remedy for overconsumption? Or is this just going to be trash? In search of new big ideas on how to break the stress cycle and meet the challenges of our time, more and more people believe in an unconditional basic income. But believing alone is not enough. We want to know. This is at the German Institute for Economic Research and the non-profit Mein Grundeinkommen are launching the first German pilot project. Financed by over 140,000 people, like you and me, people who want to know. You want to know too? Then why don't you just join in? Find out more about the pilot project and become part of the study. BasicIncomePilot.org Wow, a whole... Okay, so um, we're now asking the question, uh, as you might have heard in the video, um, not only how does basic income affect you on a personal level, um, but we want to know what if everyone had this money, um, what we have heard the same effect so many times, stress reduction, being more happy, being a more motivated person at work. Um, like, is there a pattern and what would this pattern mean to the whole society of everyone? had UBI. Um, so we set up uh, six theses um, and we combined them with the, uh, with the current crises in our uh, Western society. Uh, at first, um, and this is our theory of change, we believe that uh, the UBI has an effect on, the, on your mental capacity. And once um, the fear of existence is lowered, um, you will have more capacity to think about the good things in life. You will take better decisions and you will be able to um, yeah, leave the cycle of stress that's holding us back. And we believe this is very much true, not only for poor people, but also in the middle class where people have more fear of existence than they usually want to admit. Next, there's the um, digital revolution, obviously changing the way our economy works. Um, and in this huge transition, uh, transition, there's a lot of concerns, um, pretty obvious concerns. Um, people fearing, feared of losing their jobs and in this very accelerated society, not being able to keep up. And um, we want to find out, um, will people with a UBI be less feared of the future? Will they take more risky job decisions? Will they um, educate themselves more because they um, now have the time and the money to do so. Um, will they invest in their job future rather than just try to stick to their old job and defend it against the machines, which will be a battle to lose sooner or later anyway. Um, then there obviously is the topic of work. As I said earlier, we don't, um, we've never really noticed that people would not work anymore. But uh, we want to find out then, does there, is there actually an effect on work? And um, we have the hypothesis that uh, work will become better because people um, yeah, actually are actually asking themselves for the first time usually the question, what do I really want? What do I want to contribute? What am I really good at? And when they're changing a job, we want to know, do they earn more money? Are they working more productively, maybe, um, because they don't have to fear of the fear of losing their jobs? Maybe are they also taking better decisions in the office? And um, then we have the social cohesion. Um, people, um, yeah, I don't know, being more and more angry at each other. And um, we want to find out when you are less stressed, when you have less fear of existence, will you stop pointing the finger at others? Uh, to make you feel uh, normal and secure and right? Or will you um, have more capacity for empathy, empathy, um, empathy. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is a field that we're very much interested in. We're gonna uh, check if the polarization of topics 
uh, will change if you will have more um the ability to um i don't know how to say it um and um will the level of trust rise like we saw in finland for example uh, as we know that trust is one of the major economic factors and then also of course we have the crisis of uh, democracy and uh, you saw in the video the far right rising in many european well actually in, in many western countries um and the debate culture is um yeah is under attack basically um there's a lot of accusation there's um a lot of uh radicals and um katya kipping <laughs> always said uh um, basic income is democracy money. It's it's uh, it's an amount that gives you um, uh, independency in your decisions. Um, that takes the um, the fear also from the debates. Maybe you don't have to to um, lead debates with the arguments of protecting what you uh, your security net, but maybe uh, with the security in your back you can take also more democratic decisions, listen better, better to others. Um, um, maybe you'll be more likely to go vote uh, as we found out in Finland now just a few days ago. Um, and uh, then last but very much not least is the biggest crisis of all that is uh, threatening our existence, the environmental crisis. And um, to fight this crisis, we all know that we have to uh, be happy with less, that we have to live a life of uh, frugality. Um, but right now in our society, there's no sign that we're going to get to this kind of society. So actually, there's no way of surviving. <laughs> um, but so what are we going to do? What is what is going to be the foundation that makes us do the change that needs to be done? And uh, we have the hypothesis that UBI um, leads to less um, uh, compensative consumption that right now when you go to, to work and you get a, a wage and you feel very much stressed, um, you might just want to spend it on anything. And we know that fast consumption and stressful consumption, uh, stress correlates with, um, with bad consumption. And what if when the stress really does decrease, will people and think more about their consumption decisions. Uh, will maybe the UBI be the psychological uh, foundation on which we can change to a more sustainable society? This, these are the very large questions that we want to find out. Of course, um, the, the approach is very simple. We're still giving money to individuals, but now we're not only um, tr telling the stories and listening, but now we're actually studying it and therefore uh, with, uh, we partnered up with the Deutsche Institut für Wirtschaftsforschung uh, in Berlin, the Wirtschaftsuni Wien, the Universität zu Köln, and the Oxford University. Um, what are we actually doing? <laughs> um, we're doing a randomized controlled trial with uh, 1,500 subjects, um, of whom 122 receive uh, UBI of 1,200 euros and um, for the period of three years. The rest of the participants is in the control group. Um, the money, money also comes from, from our monthly donors. And um, the cool thing about our project is that it's completely independent from any political parties, from, from uh, any investor or anything, because uh, we just have these 200,000 people who give us money each month. And um, it's a very, very comfortable situation. It is, uh, of course, the first pilot project in Germany that has always been around. And the setup is very special because um, it's the first worldwide project that is not um, trialing uh, poor people, but is focusing on the middle class. Uh, it's the so-called Mitte im engeren Sinne. Um, it's the people between um, yeah, I'll show you in a second. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the people uh, between 1,200 and 2,600 euros net income in single households. And that's actually also the group parameters that we had to focus on as we're having a very small trial group of 120 people. We needed 
to make the group a little more homogeneous. We could not have everyone participate in the group because then the statistical error would be too large and we could not see any effects. That's why um, we had the perfect situation of 2.1 million applicants uh, the year before last year when we started um, the media campaign to, um, yeah, to collect applications. And we had fantastic, a fantastic database to, um, to find the very best people for the project. But then, unfortunately, we had to limit ourselves uh, to a smaller group, which is now the 21 to 40 years old and single households in the middle class. And uh, we asked many parameters in the application, also if they were in favor of the UBI or not. And as we have like a 50-50 share in the German population, we took 50% of the people uh, into the trial that were not in favor of the UBI so that we don't have uh, so much the self-selection problem here as of course people who liked the idea of the UBI were much more attracted by the project. Um, yeah, as you see, um, this approach is uh, um, yeah, it's it's the approach that is strategically chosen. We um we've uh, made the experience that um well, let me put it another way: the middle class is by far the largest group in Germany. Um, these people in this income range make up sixty percent of the German population, and uh, these are the people that you have to convince. That's the majority. That's the ones that. Uh, need to know why a UBI would be good for them. Um, and that's why you need to tell the stories. Uh, we made the experience in the past eight years, whenever we tell the story of poor people who now have enough to live um, and can be helped better with a UBI than the classical um, social security, um, we just didn't get any media traction because nobody really cared, which is a very sad thing. But um, I don't know if you want to accept it, um, you have to deal with it. And um, that's why we're trying to find out. I mean, it's pretty obvious and from other trials that uh, UBI is good for poor people and it increases their welfare and their possibilities. But um, yeah, here we're focusing on does it also apply to people in the middle class? And I believe it does. It's just that we don't know it yet because it has never been done. Um, what are the research methods? Um, uh, it was important to us that we have um, a very broad approach. We want to take a look at the effects of UBI from every thinkable angle. And we have uh, every six months a 25 minute survey. This is like the, the basis. And then we have hair samples to measure the cortisol and stress level in your hair. We connected to the official German labor market data. Um, we have made uh, interviews with the people and we're planning to do IQ tests and um, get a copy of their insurance bills to see if uh, um, health costs go up or down. And the IQ test is uh, obviously a reference to the scarcity um, uh, researchers whose name I forgot. Um, that said, if you have a, a scarcity in, for example, money, it can actually even affect your IQ. We've, um, we've been working on more research methods recently, um, but unfortunately they have just failed the uh, last week. <laughs> um, we developed a mobility tracking, that uh, an app that tracks your mobility and calculates your carbon foot footprint. And also we developed a banking app where you could um, connect to your online banking and automatically uh, read your uh, bank transactions through AI and categorize them. So we have a very detailed, but very simple to analyze way of um, seeing the changes in your expenditures and income. But uh, unfortunately we had to realize that people were not willing to uh, join this, these methods. So we, cancel them. So what's next for us in the project um, before I would like to go into discussion with you is um, right now we um, have first results um, from last November. Um, and right now we're in the process of the second um, questionnaire. And uh, next week we'll have the results of 
this. However, we are not allowed to publish the results before June of next year. So a little more than one year. We'll have to wait because um, uh, we don't want to bias our, our treatment group. Um, but after that, the results will be public and we'll see if we can find answers to the very big questions. And then we're hoping um, that the debate about UBI will shift from the uh, yeah, very simple arguments, people will be lazy and it's not possible to finance it, um, to what is it actually good for for our society? Like what, what's, the, what's the value of this investment? Why are we doing this? Why, why should we even think about such a huge transition? What's in it for us? Does it really help us to solve our crises? Do we really need a UBI? Um, and if we find out that this is the case, we want to start a new experiment, hopefully also in the end of next year, maybe the year after we're right now um, um, drafting the concept. And um, the idea here is to, uh, after we have solved the question, like what, is the, what does money on top uh, change? We now have to find out, well, to be honest, um, a real UBI, everyone would get the thousand euros, but uh, you would also have to pay much more taxes. So starting in the middle class, upper middle class, people would probably pay more taxes than they would receive as a UBI. Um, and in this uh, redistribution model, um, the people we are now testing would not really get more money. So the big question is, um, what happens if they don't get more money, but if they pretty much have the same money as today, but uh, have a security, a guaranteed income, um, uh, an unconditional income for the first thousand euros they already have. And so in the second experiment, we're going to do exactly that. We're going to play state and simulate an income tax. Uh, so in the, the months, we'll, we will actually send everyone uh, different heights of UBI. And then um, we will also calculate a virtual tax. And in the end of the month, we'll get the money back from their banking account. And um, see if the effects that we hopefully find out in the first round of our current experiments are still applying when people actually don't have more money, but only have only have unconditional money. Um, I think this is a hypothesis that has never been checked before. Um, and I think this is really, really about time to talk about this because only giving money to people um, is not what UBI does to the vast majority of the of the society. Um, most people do have an income today and therefore have to pay higher taxes and will never see the well, they will see it in the beginning of the month, but in the end, they won't have more uh, than they have today or at least not not 1000 euros more. So in our next uh, experiment starting then we will try to evaluate this question. What is the optimal taxation? What is an optimal UBI? How much of the effect that we saw in our current study will still apply? Thank you very much. And now I'm looking forward to your questions and discussion. Okay, please unshare your screen uh, so we can see everybody when they join in. And uh, everyone, um, please uh, please raise your hand if your electronic hand um, if you would uh, if you would like to uh, if you have any questions, please raise your electronic hand. I would also uh, that's for the the Zoom participants, the local people. Uh, okay, uh, Tobias raised his hand. Tobias, what do you have? Please uh, so I hope turn your video you on can, and start talking. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, thank you. We can hear you just fine. Uh, the one question I have about the, um, if you control for the employment status from the, um, RCT. So if you check if they change the employment situation, get self-employed or something like that. Yeah, we check this uh, every six months. We ask them if something changed in their job 
and then they have to tell us all their jobs and um, for each job we ask um, yeah uh, if they're happy what are the working conditions uh, would they would they switch jobs are they looking for new jobs um, do they um, uh, would they work for different wage and all these kind of questions also for the people who have several jobs thank you yeah okay. great thank you Okay, anybody else? That was, that was an unusually quick question. And if anybody would prefer to type the question and have me read it, feel free. Um, I, I, I do have uh, a, a couple of things to say. Um, one, one is that uh, we spoke this afternoon. I'm, I, I was, uh, I, I'm, I'm also in Berlin right now. We're in different parts of town. Um, you can tell by the well, walls are different colors. Um, I, uh, uh, I came by and, and saw the office where they organized all the mine Grundein come and stuff and met some of the staff today and had a nice discussion with them about uh, the pitfalls of, of doing experiments. And uh, one thing I didn't say enough is I think this is, this is a really important thing, both for learning about basic income and for promoting basic income. You're doing something that nobody else is doing and out of scale that few people are doing. And it's really going to increase the visibility of UBI worldwide, not just not just in Germany, not just in the EU, but worldwide. Um, and I think that's a great thing. And focusing on telling people stories and get this thing out there, I think I think is a really good thing. I'd like to hear me now. What do you say? Now, um, like uh, when this 2023 project starts, like what's the like the, the the best and worst case scenario, the possibilities of how many people will get it for how long, the best and worst case scenario, depending mm. on the fundraising and stuff. What are we looking at? Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little careful with uh, selling mm -hmm. too many details because I'm pretty sure that a lot of things will change um, mm -hmm. uh, till then. Um, but um, like if I could make wishes, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I think... 1,800 people would be great. So we have a representative mm -hmm. sample for the working population, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. And, um, and then, of course, the, the good situation about uh, testing the taxes as well is um, you need a lot of liquidity because at the beginning of the month, you, have to do, you do have to send out the basic income. But at the end of the month, um, the money will come back, uh, or, or at, least, at least a big part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, depending on how the people are per, uh, performing uh, income wise so um the experiment is going to be a lot cheaper than uh, what we're doing right now where every participant costs 1200 euros each month and our idea is to have an adaptive study design where uh, you would get have different groups of ubi heights and uh, different tax rates and have them all combined in different groups and then see uh, which group has the um, highest welfare factor, meaning um, you have like a normative, um, uh, you set one normative thing in the beginning saying uh, um, an additional euro a pure, poor person has is more valuable than an additional euro a rich person has. And then mm -hmm. we see, um, uh, and then of course, it, we want also want to find out like, is there a reduction um, or a decline in the workforce? Um, and then see where the sweet spot is between high taxes and maybe a high UBI, and uh, where we can measure um, most of the performance from the other, other factors from our first study. Mm -hmm. Does this an answer your question? No, oh, well enough, yeah, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> okay, I would also, I also would like to, uh, uh, while I while I have the chance here, I'd like to ask answer begin and answer a question that you asked me this afternoon, um, because we're talking about we're talking about what often happens um, what often happens when you have a, a UBI experiment of any kind is one of the, is that some will someone will point out in the results that oh look this person didn't work as much as they did before. Um, and 
of course, UBI, if it's generous enough, allows that. Is it, whereas other many other programs are 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 predicated on we've got to wait. You've got to either work or prove that you got to work. And often they will say that, and they will spin it in a way that this is always and everywhere a bad thing, and that it's an overriding factor for everything. And you ask me, uh, you ask me um, uh, if I well. well I was thinking the way I handle that is to counterattack and say it's really not good to assume that the lower classes are working the right amount right now. Maybe the disadvantaged people who work hard, maybe one of the problems is they, they have to work too hard for what they get and they should be refusing bad jobs and we should go into it that way. Um, and really, uh, the best, uh, you know, my thoughts have been the best defense is good offense. And you said, well, you can do that strategy. But if you do that strategy, um, you're kind of challenging a real basic assumption that a lot of a lot of people hold, not just people who react this way. Um, that um, and and then say, well, then if you don't want to challenge that assumption, how would you handle it? You asked me. They asked me kind of that advice, and it kind of stymied me on that because I. Uh, that's just that's what I do, you know. I challenge that assumption. That's my that's the role I have, and they that I've carved for myself. In the UBI debate. How how would I do it without that? One thing I would look out for, I would look out for in, endorsing it, or even tacitly endorse it. I think there are ways to address it without saying, yeah, it's a good thing that that people didn't work more. What I would, uh, so as I think about it, as I think about it, you avoid endorsing it, but show what do we get for this? Um, well, okay, yeah, this person worked, worked less, but look what, what they worked less. That means uh, they were unemployed a little bit longer, but they found a better job. You'll be able to tell that story about a lot of people. Um, and look what else we're getting in this. This also is likely to lead to less sexual harassment on the job. And uh, I don't know if you'll be able to get any data on that, um, but better working, does it lead people to be able to, to leave places that have bad working conditions? Certainly, yeah, you want people to work, but you also don't want bad employers that are giving people bad things. And, and uh, emphasize, emphasize that the things that you're getting for that. So connecting, connecting the thing that they don't want to see for the things that most people agree are good things. Like, low-end people getting higher wage, getting better working conditions. At least people say that's a good thing. Try to connect it with these other things without endorsing it. Because I think if you endorse this uh, and say, uh, one of the things people say, well, yeah, people work less, but that was small. Well, uh, it's never small enough for some people. And I don't think when people say, oh, no one will work, they, that they're they really mean no one will work. They're really emoting and saying, I don't want a policy that allows anybody to live without working unless they're rich. Um, and if all they're doing is emoting, no amount of evidence, if, if that's what they really mean, no amount of evidence is gonna, get, is gonna counteract that. So what you gotta do is look at what they're getting for it instead. So my question to you then is, do um, you think that's a good way to handle it? Framing and for this, we get that. Um, I think it's a very good approach, and it's it's one that I would be hoping for uh, that we that we um, get into the situation um, or that we actually do get the story these kind of stories to tell. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that it's going to work, um, but I think it's a yeah, it's a fundamental question. I mean, what is the purpose of the UBI? Um, do we want to, is the UBI a vehicle to implement a, a, a radical system change? Is it a, a technology to maybe overcome core mechanisms of capitalism, like um, exploitation? Um, yeah. Then I would say we have to uh, tell more the stories of the freedom to say no. And, um, and uh, well, I mean, we can tell whatever we want. I think at first we have to measure and see what actually happens. Um, mm -hmm. uh, or is it, a, is it a mechanism that um, the UBI that uh, stabilizes capitalism because um, mm -hmm. it fi fixes the most obvious bugs? Because I mean, obviously the system isn't working for a lot of people and that are falling behind now creating other problems. So um, 
it is really tough to answer that question. Yeah. And uh, right now our strategy is to leave it over to the people and just to uh, to be the, the moderator of the debate, um, sending out the the money transfer and then um, have uh, give the people the platform to tell their story. Now, as we're doing science here, it's a different story also. Um, I mean, this is true science and not a not a marketing campaign. Uh, we have um, uh, <laughs> serious uh, research partners who um, um, will write papers on whatever they find out. It's not like I really have the chance to frame what uh, what they're saying. So um, yeah. we have this huge um, debate out there that uh, UBI and labor seems to be connected somehow. It's a it's a huge narrative that has been built up for hundreds of years that money and uh, work are so strongly connected that I have the fear that we won't get away from this debate if we mm -hmm. if we don't um, emphasize it ourselves that. Um, because maybe it's very likely that we have don't don't have strong findings in in the um, working hours, no. and if if we don't uh, emphasize it, um, then most likely the critics will still say if everyone had it they will get lazy. I think it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, yeah. We well, it is. Results. I mean, look at look at the finished project. That was uh, uh, the the idea was uh, to make people work more. And then they worked just the same, and it was sold as a as a, um, a failure. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, uh, yeah. And there are people who will try to play it like a trump card. They will say one person works one hour less per year. That's the reason we can never do this policy. They say it, that doesn't trump all these good effects. Look at all these other effects that that is these these really good effects. You can do that without endorsing their point of view that it's necessarily a bad thing uh, that, that is going. I think that's one way to do it. Uh, another thing, which I guess you're probably already doing, is time study. Um, to those people who do work, work less, what are they doing? Are they, are they ending up with better jobs once they, once, if, if this happens while they're unemployed? Um, are they ending up in better jobs? Are they spending more time with their kids? Are they spending more time in education? Um, things like that. I'm sure you're already doing this, but emphasizing, yeah, you got that, but you get that. Yeah, we're tracking uh, the, the time of the people and um, yeah, try to find out everything uh, they're doing in their private life, basically, Yeah. Um, through the time use um, approach. And uh, yeah. And we'll see. Like I, right now, we're in the period where we have to just measure, and then we'll see what stories can be told then. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the special situation with the middle class, where we might not see such strong effects as we would see if we do, did the same test with people who have uh, no or very little income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to look at that at that group. I also want to, want to emphasize that this is one. This, is, this project is unique in many ways, but it's one of many projects, going, or two now, of many projects going on around the world. We're going to talk in a few minutes to coordinators of a couple of dozen mini experiments around the United States, which together add up to uh, a big experiment. Um, and, uh, and this is a great opportunity to try out different methodologies and see how they compare. Uh, uh, how does giving it to this target group in the first one and the target group to the second one, uh, how, how do those two things compare? How can we compare them? What kind of methodology do we need to compare them? And then how do those compare to this, the experiments that have been going on like this, uh, going on for this um, in, uh, well, for 50 years now, on and off? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I got your question. Oh, I guess it wasn't really a question. <laughs> it was more of a statement. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you have any reactions, okay. otherwise, I'll go to the next question. Yeah, next question. Okay. Uh, Niharika, uh, you're next. Thank you, Professor. Um, so I, I read your magazine, Mind Groom Line Common, and in, in that it was written that Mind Grundlein Common works like a startup 
So like you build prototypes, you test them and like you see what the impact are and then you build a larger prototype and you repeat this until we have information to say whether basic income works or not. But what I want to ask is where does this stop and, and like where do we move towards an actual implementation from an experiment? I mean, I understand like especially for basic income, we cannot really always for all factors generalize the results with a large certainty. Because let's say this works and now we need to see if it works on an even larger scale, which, which sounds like a logical question when we first look at it. But also the scale or, or this extent uh, would never be large enough unless we take into account the entire population, right? So what would be that threshold or, or that, that threshold scale or, of study or experiment where we can probably stop with an experiment and maybe look towards an actual policy? Um, thank you for the question. Um, the honest answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> As I said, there has never been a master plan behind all of this. I was trying just to do a crowdfunding campaign for 12,000 euros. <laughs> now it's 14 millions and uh, I don't know where this is going to stop. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, but um, you see, I'm, I'm wondering what else can we do um, there in Germany and I think in most countries there's no major political debate of implementing a UBI usually also not about implementing a UBI trial and that is run by the state so I think with this approach we're trying to push the state to take action um, but but not um, forcing him to um, we don't believe in the approach of forcing but more to inspire and um, um, uh, show that it's possible by just doing it. <laughs> it's possible because we've done it. And of course, we had to uh, start with small funds, but now as the funds are growing and the movement is growing, uh, we can do better and more trials. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I was asking this question to myself and um, actually there, you don't really need a state. <laughs> If you look at it in an abstract way, I mean, it's just a redistributional system between people. If you have all their banking account numbers and they're all willing to do it, I mean, the state obviously has one advantage. They have the power to enforce at tax um, payments. <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge advantage. Um, but I mean, what if we found 5 million people in Germany who are now willing to just pay for the income of others? Um, we know from a from a survey that 9.1% of the people in Germany um, think that in a UBI redistribution system, they would uh, be on the side of the losers, but still are in favor of the idea. That's a lot of people. That's uh, almost 10% of the population who um, like the idea so much that they would like it, even if they are not winning. Maybe you just have to organize these people to make a a trial that it's that is so large that uh, you could argue if it's still a trial or like a kind of a parallel society prototyping utopia so um let's see um thank you and i have sorry can i ask one more question follow up please okay um so so if uh so I, like i got that that you said that there's no plan for implementation but still like in the magazine it was written that if it were to be implemented it wouldn't really replace all the existing social welfare policies, but maybe a few complicated money transfers. Um, so my question is, how like do you plan to, and if so, how you would like plan to accommodate for the possible impact of this? Because right now, a person in this study is eligible for both the existing benefits plus the basic income of twelve hundred euros, but in reality, this wouldn't be the case, right? So how how would you? account for those effects yeah uh, it's a tough question because um obviously we're not the state <laughs> and um it's it's very difficult to test a completely different system within the current system um so we do have some trade-offs there in our current project is i think not as i understood you because when you are participating and receive 1200 euros a month uh, it will be counted as regular income or as a as a gift, but uh, 
kind of works the same. So you will not be eligible for um, for social welfare right now. So you would have to take the decision, do I take the current welfare system or do I take the UBI, which is to us, of course, a very interesting uh, decision. Um, and this is how we're going to have to leave it. We'll just offer the people to take our money and uh, we'll always try to um, have the UBI as high as possible so that um, it's actually a choice for the people because they would in the best case always have more with the UBI than they had today. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Okay, do you have more? Oh, I guess not. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, uh, do no. you have more? Thank no, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Maria, you're next. Please uh, video and unmute. Uh, my question, uh, you talk about the mobility tracking and bank account analysis. Do you think that what can be the real reason for the people not to cooperate with this uh, bank account analysis? Like they don't want that they uh, being washed or they just being uh, like, they don't want that uh, people should know that where they are actually spending their uh, money they are getting as an UBI. Um, uh, to be honest, also, I don't exactly know um, because mm -hmm. we are not uh, interviewing the treatment group on, on how they think our research methods are because we don't want dialogue with them. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think it's due to privacy reasons. It just feels awkward to give someone access to your banking account. I mean, we do it all the time with our banking apps and uh, with, <laughs> with uh, financial apps. But um, uh, of course, uh, we, we try to make everything very transparent. And once you do that, um, it's more threatening than what you do all the time without being informed. <laughs> so yeah. I think we just have to accept it. Um, and that's maybe a natural limitation also of trials that um, you just can't measure everything. And even if you can measure a lot, um, it's, it's, you, you can never be certain that uh, it's a representation of the... <laughs> Do you think it can be an, any other way to get to know that where this money is pro uh, being used properly other than this banking account system? Uh, we did have an approach. Well, we still do. And this is the one we will be focusing on now, um, where we just ask the people how much uh, spendings they had. But um, this requires them to remember their larger spendings of the past half year. Okay. And that's not a very convenient method. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so do we have do we have any other questions? We're almost out of time, but I do have time for a quick question if anybody has one. Yes, I have a question. Maybe I can join. Okay, please. Please ask. Yeah. Uh, Michael, thank you for this uh, talk. And uh, I'm really looking forward to read the study um, as a scientist. And uh, I mean, I also have a scientific question because as neutral as you put like uh, science that is like scientifically, scientifically accompanied, it isn't because um, also the research design tells a narrative or is a narrative. So why, or could you elaborate, please, again, why did you select, like, uh, the group between 21 and 40 and not between, like, 40 and 50 or, like, elderly people, you know? Uh, maybe for them it's also important because in one sentence you said, um, this is the group we have to convince. And here I'm a bit skeptical. Is this still, like, a scientific approach or is this, like, an advocate approach? Mm. It's, um, in my thinking, these can never be two completely separate worlds. I think it would be an illusion uh, if there would be something that is only neutral science. There's no such thing, I think. Um, we had a long discussion on how to focus the group because it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a not a nice situation because obviously UBI is for everyone. And when you're in the situation of having to decide who, who gets it, um, 
it sucks. <laughs> that's, that's the opposite of the idea. So um, one thing is important to me, everyone did have the chance to participate. We had wildcard seats um, that were randomly chosen from all applicants. So it was, um, it was not for nothing to participate and to give your data to us. So that's, that was really important. That was kind of like our backdoor for our moral. <laughs> um, and uh, no, I, we, we, it was not a political strategy movement to take the 40 to 20 to 40 years old. It was just that uh, we, th we thought that we could see the most effect in this age range because that's when the mobility is the highest. When you take job decisions and education decisions, when you move, when you get a child, when you find a partner, when you get your first income. And um, as we have this very small panel, we um, need to have uh, strong effects to have something significant. And this was the reason why we chose this pretty young age group. Um, what I said earlier was um, was the middle class argument, and that's actually that's a political strategy argument in this. So that means we have to simulate as uh, that we give it to everyone. And how do we simulate it if we don't have enough for everyone? Well, I would start with the largest group, and that's the middle income group in Germany, and. Um, that that you could call this a political campaigning strategy, but I think it's just reasonable to start uh, with the bottom of the iceberg and not the tiny little top. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, uh, to Jessica and the other people who are remaining in the queue, my apologies. Um, we're out of time. We've got to go to our break. Um, maybe the, the next, the next um, presentation is going to be related. We've got people doing something similar in the United States to what uh, Mikhail is doing in, in Germany. Well, with substantial differences, but some similarities. Um, and uh, so maybe your question will be rel relevant there. And uh, uh, so hopefully you'll be able to get your comment in. Uh, but I would like to thank you, uh, Mikhail, and uh, thanks a lot. And we will take, uh, we have eight minutes for a break and the next speakers will start at, uh, we'll start at five minutes after the hour, which hour depends on your time zone, but we'll see you all in five minutes. And thanks again, Michael, and, and, and looking forward to what uh, all the rest of the stuff that's gonna be coming out from my new, my Grundein comments for the next, I don't know how many years. Okay, um, Stacia and Amy, can we get you on here to sound check uh, real quick? Okay, I can see you. Hey there, how are you? Hi, good. I am very good. Okay. Hey, Carl, good to see you. Okay. Um, okay, make sure I know who's, uh, wh whose voice I'm hearing at each time. Uh, Amy, could you speak? Amy and only Amy? Yep, this is Amy. Okay, and Stacia, and only Stacia, can you speak? Hey, this is Stacia. Oh, Stacia. Okay. Wow, if, have I not heard it out loud before? Or maybe you know, I just forgot. I don't know. Amy called me Stacia for like a good six months. She, uh, okay. she didn't correct. <laughs> I just don't correct people. Yeah. I don't feel so bad then. Okay. So, uh, okay, now. Uh, do you two have anything to share? Uh, give me a share screen. Okay. Uh, Tobias, have you given them the power to share screen? Yes, oh. your co-host. Um, so now, could you each, each test sharing your screens? Uh, Amy, you went first with the talking. Let's see, is that you, Amy? Uh, I'm going to have Stacia do the slide. She does better. It, it's better if one yeah. of us feels it, so she'll, she'll do that. So I'm okay. sharing now. Are we able to see it on your I, end? I can see it. Yeah, looks good. Looks good to me. All right. So that leaves us um, six minutes of additional break time before we start. I think that's everything we need in a sound check. So uh, I will, uh, when we come back, I'll introduce you all. And then I will uh, mute myself and turn my mic off so they'll, they'll just see you. Okay.
All right, I'll see good. you in a minute. Okay. Just real quick, uh, Carl, I sent you an email, but we do have a noon hour time hard stop. I know that we had hoped to be able to go 15 minutes after the hour, um, but we have some scheduling difficulties. Um, okay. So we'll just be able to do 55 minutes and I hope that's okay. 55 minutes is fine. Okay, um, great. That's, we'll try all, to that's lean, all Michael got. So Yeah, we'll try to lean towards more time for Q&A. We'll, we'll, we'll go through the slides great. You know, to provide some framing, but... Mm -hmm. Definitely want to give people the chance to, to ask questions and interact. Okay, great. All right, I'll click my thing off for just a minute here and then log back in. Well, not log back in. You know what I mean.
Okay, Tobias, you ready for me to restart? Yes, sir. All right. Um, do you need to give me a cue again? No, not, I mean, we are, we are still live, you know. Okay. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Again, this is, the, this is part two of today's Freebus workshop, workshop on basic income, an all online workshop that uh, the Freiburg Institute of Basic Income Studies does whenever we can. And uh, today, our, for our second presentation today, we have the two leaders of the Center for Guaranteed Income Research at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and those, they, they are Amy Castro, who's an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and Stacia West, who is an associate professor at the University of, Ten of Tennessee School or College of Social Work. Uh, so I would like to welcome you two here for your joint presentation. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, excited to be here in this storied series. I'm just gonna share my screen with you and we have a short presentation that we'll just run through, but we really want to provide ample opportunity for discussion um, in this space today. So a little bit about us and uh, the Center for Guaranteed Income Research. We were established in 2020 because I suppose, I don't know, we all got crazy ideas in the midst of the pandemic. So we started a research center. Um, it's led by both myself and Dr. Castro. Uh, we have an interdisciplinary staff of leading social and behavioral scientists. When we first started out, there were three, four of us in 2020, but we now have a staff of around 25 that includes uh, data scientists, ethnographers, epidemiologists, pediatricians. Um, so really a, a true interdisciplinary approach to understanding guaranteed income in the U.S. context. We also have par partnerships with local universities. I'll talk a little bit more about our research approach in the next slide. Um, but all across the country, we have co-PIs located in the, in the uh, geographies where we're implementing these studies. We exclusively focus on applied cash transfer research. So we uh, largely do randomized controlled trials. Um, I think about it as sort of a multi-site experiment um, that's spanning uh, starting in really 2018 with Stockton, California, and then moving on into 2026. Um, we have all of these new locations that are beginning. And our focus here at the center is to establish a common body of knowledge regarding cash. Um, while we look at discourse shift in the U.S. context um, around deservedness and around the social contract. So I'll say one of the things as we approach this work is that we understand the importance of common instrumentation such that if we do an experiment, say, in Los Angeles and we measure uh, employment in, in one way with one instrument, yet we do another experiment in New York and we measure employment in a different way. We then have competing narratives in the U.S. around guaranteed income. So what we, to some extent, successfully been able to pull off is bringing together a common data set. So even people that aren't working directly with us in the center are, in fact, measuring the outcomes of guaranteed income in much the same way. So at this point, we have 31 different experiments that are operating across the U.S. You can see here on this map that there is a clear concentration in the Northeast, as well as in the Western part of the US. We're increasingly seeing more pilots popping up in the Midwest. And in terms of the political context, we know that the coasts tend to be very innovative, innovative and much more progressive. Um, in the center of the country and the South tends to be quite a bit more conservative and uh, resistant to any sorts of ideas of, of economic justice, to be frank. Uh, so with these 31 different experiments, we have different sample sizes, different target populations. Um, ultimately, what we will have in the center is a database of around 16,000 individuals uh, that have participated as either a treatment group member or a control group member in any of these experiments across the US. So there are a couple of existing research gaps that really drive our work in the center. So the first is what amount of cash actually maximizes an impact? Um, and what are the key times of change? Is it a year of a guaranteed income in which we see a really positive change in mental health? Does it take 36 months of a guaranteed income before we see positive changes 
um, within uh, something like education, as well as how do these outcomes differ by groups, by different social classes, race, ethnicity, gender, constellations of relationships. And then very importantly, the geography, how is unconditional cash experienced differently by policy subsystems? And also, how does cost of living factor into this? Another thing that we do is look at investigating policy pathways, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Castro. Yeah, so within kind of this, this particular category in terms of the research, we're really trying to push, especially the lawmakers that we're working with in terms of experimenting with cash to think about and mentalize what would it actually take for um, a, a guaranteed income program or a UBI to actually be put in place within the United States. So um, asking three kind of key questions. So first is asking what drives take up, knowing that human engagement is everything. So um, in particular, you know, in the United States context, most of the groups that are involved in our treatment condition are people who've been targeted by risky brokers, have experienced the worst, the worst that capitalism has to offer, and that really drives whether or not they will engage with any type of policy or program. And so really understanding how those prior experiences are driving whether or not they're even um, engaging with policy take up. Um, second, infrastructure. Um, and that's both practical in terms of, you know, what, what types of scaffolding need to be in place within government, but then also human contact. Um, you know, we know from our earlier experiment in Stockton and then some of the ones that we're running right now, that we, you actually need a little bit of that um, friction that's created by human contact to maintain these programs over time and rebuild trust. Um, and then third, and we'll talk about this more as we go on, um, asking these broader questions of what does it take to build political and public will around unconditional cash? Um, and within our context, we know that we have to have sort of a coalition um, around um, empirical data, but then also consensus that starts to be building within the public sphere around um, pushing back on these notions of deservedness and really some more momentum for cash. Can you go to the next slide, Stacia? Sure. So we use a mixed methods approach to all of these research studies. For the most part, um, what you see is measurement that occurs at six month intervals and lasts beyond the duration of the actual guaranteed income itself for six months so that we can essentially pick up the stickiness of the intervention. Um, does guaranteed income have sticky effects, if you will? So some of the things that we measure quantitatively um, this is kind of our core set of questions. It's around physical and mental health, financial security, finan uh, family dynamics and parenting. Importantly, the interaction with public benefits, housing stability, in some cases, housing quality, food insecurity, educational and employment outcomes, um, and, and new things that we're measuring are around unpaid care work and time use, as well as household decision-making and adaptation. So while we look at all of these across the core, right, uh, kind of survey instrument, we also are then able to look at how does $500 versus $1,000 impact physical and mental health? How does 12 months of an experiment compared to 36 months of an experiment uh, impact food insecurity um, while also looking again at the heterogeneity of this really large sample of individuals? Um, so that's kind of the quantitative side of things, which is much more dry. Uh, Dr. Castro, tell us about the call. Oh, it's not. Oh, there. Okay. 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 I, I keep getting, I'm unmuting and then something is remuting me. We good? Uh, I think that was maybe me trying to ask you to unmute at the oh. very <laughs> second that you unmuted, which, which uh, it means no really switch to the mute button because Whoever designed this program had a great idea. Yeah, no, no problem. So um, on the qual front, um, we're doing these a little bit differently. So um, we're employing a big qual methodology, sort of asking the question, is there a way to sort of engage in rapid short form ethnography across all these different sites? Um, so that's something that we're working on right now. So qualitatively, we're taking, a the approach we're taking is three pronged. Um, so first are, you know, your traditional semi-structured in-depth interviews um, that as we're picking up changes quantitatively, we're then able to follow up with people one-on-one um, -on -one and determine how um, they're, they're experiencing guaranteed income and experiencing the market economy at the same time. So a lot of our questions right now are focused on household decision-making and adaptation. And then especially for caregivers, how are they making sense of the infusion of cash alongside unpaid care work, which is a, a really key driver. Um, then second, we're taking um, with sites that either have something really unique about them or the population 
um, just is situated within the policy landscape differently. We're taking a much more in-depth ethnography approach um, through co-PIs and other folks that we're working with where we'll be following cohorts of people over time. And then third, in addition to other part activities that we do that I can answer um, later, um, is we're really experimenting with capturing mixed methods data around time use and care work through um, time diary apps. So that's something that we're launching in the next month. So that ideally we'll be able to see not only quantitatively how, or how does the infusion of cash shift the way that people experience time, um, but alongside um, meaning making and how that may or may not impact household dynamics specifically for women. Go ahead, Stacia. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to talk about this, huh? Okay. <laughs> so um, the big, the question we get a lot is sort of why, right? So anytime we're talking with groups, and I think this is a very justifiable pushback that we get is, you know, the, we'll, people often say to us, um, we know that cash works. Why, why are you wasting your time um, implementing 31 some odd experiments with all these, like, why? What's the point? Um, there, there's a lot of reasons that, that we do this, but chief among them is really this sort of driving issue that we have around deservedness and social construction. So we know that social constructions drive um, the way that the public interprets ideas around cash, um, and they also drive the way that people interpret the social safety net, which we're very keen on preserving when we think about um, these experiments here in the United States. And so these racialized narratives that are really, um, you know, literally concocted in the 80s um, and they carry a long legacy, but they function as sort of shame and blame, you know, layers that are placed on top of the safety net. And in some cases, pay, placed on top of cash that serve as a deterrent from people engaging in programs, policies, and in rights that, that they're owed because they're human. Um, and when we don't kind of do that work to dismantle those narratives or address those social constructions, what we will see happen is the migration of that shame and blame narrative off of the welfare state and onto unconditional cash, um, which you know we obviously want to dismantle both of those things. Um, so when we think about that, we're really pushing back on these ideas around deservedness through careful public engagement. Um, there's lots we could say about the details as to how we do that, but I'll, I'll save that for Q&A. Um, and then third, the other thing we're really interested in making certain we have an eye towards in our context specifically is inequality around implementation. So here in the US, our sort of path determination with policy take up really drive social problems over time. So when I think about the New Deal and the groups of people that were either locked out literally from access to benefits that were created in the 1930s, we can see the impact in the racial wealth gap, the gender wealth gap, home ownership, economic mobility, all of these sort of structures, we can trace back to policy and implementation gaps that happened in the New Deal. Um, we see the same thing happening with the CARES Act, where there was tremendous lack of take up among particular groups where they did not trust um, the federal government for good reason <laughs> to engage and receive that cash. Um, and something that we're seeing right now across many of our experiments is a real um, uneven um, both experience and take up, not just with federal programs for cash, but also within our programs among households that have mixed documentation status. And then we're also seeing um, a, in the wake of kind of this anti-LGBT backlash that's happening in the United States, a real pressure around programs that are prioritizing queer individuals in a way that can dis, you know, essentially, again, serve as a deterrent from people accessing rights. So with this, where are we going from here? In the short term, the next three to five years, it's really about driving public conversation and leveraging current experiments to secure waivers and implementation pathways. I was having a conversation with our colleague, Michael Lewis, who is one of the intellectual giants of guaranteed income, as well as Aisha Nyanduro, who implemented the first guaranteed income experiment actually in the US before Stockton um, post uh, the Syme Dime experiment. So she started back in 2017. And we were talking about, you know, why are we doing these, why are we doing these pilots, right? And, you know, the, what came out of that is we're not going to change hearts and minds with data. Absolutely not. So what's the point of, of the data? Well, it's simply to provide some sort of evidence to individuals that already believe in guaranteed income, yet don't necessarily have the strong evidence that will, you know, it, it could take, right, in order to push legislation. 
Um, but that's not going to win over anyone who doesn't believe in basic human dignity and doesn't believe that a person uh, has a right to housing, has a right to food on the table. So the things that we're doing in order to drive that conversation really focus on a public release of the data dashboard. So for example, uh, back in 2019, we released uh, the data dashboard for SEED, which included spending data um, that was aggregated and de-identified. Um, and you saw all of these media, right, that are splashing around in the U.S. saying, look at this, poor folks know how to spend their money. They know, you know, how to budget. This things we all know, right? But it really did help drive uh, the public conversation and dismantle some toxic narratives that we have in the U.S. about how people are poor because of moral failure. So we look at that and we continue to drive public conversations with kind of early, early releases of data, um, as well as pairing those with storytelling or individuals that choose to go public, tell their stories to the media and actually have the potential of changing hearts and minds because suddenly I see an individual that looks like myself or my family member, right, who's receiving this guaranteed income and I can identify with them. In the long term, five to seven years, we'll be able to execute cross-site analyses. So as I said, we have experiments that actually won't conclude until around 2027. So once we have our big giant data set, we'll be able to do those geographically focused kind of analyses as well. Um, and then Dr. Castro, the big qual and the mixed methods archive, I think, which is going to be one of the largest in, in the world. I don't know. Uh, probably, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. So um, one of the things that we're doing qualitatively is we're using again, co a common sort of semi-structured interview guide across all the sites, but then of course, just like the quant, those are tailored based on location. So, you know, if you're familiar with qualitative methodology, you know that sort of the researcher is the instrument, right? And we have an embarrassment of rich riches when it comes to thinking about the data that we have. So we'll, we're gonna be pursuing a mixed methods archive that will include um, big qual, big qual um, components of that as well to where people will be able to apply to have access to the data um, in a limited way moving forward. You know, and the hope there is really thinking about what are the other questions that people can bring to this data, but then also thinking about advocacy, right? Um, is that knowing that it's sort of em empiricism might change the minds of lawmakers, it might change the minds of academics like myself. Um, but when we think about advocacy, we know that we need to lean into narrative and that there's lots of ways that it can be leveraged um, for future projects. Is that our last slide? Yeah, I think that's our last slide. So I'll stop my screen share and then happy to take questions. Let me unmute myself and start my video briefly. Okay, uh, what I didn't tell, but I didn't tell Mikhail uh, when he was presenting uh, because I was so caught up in what the stuff I wanted to say. I forgot to tell him I had a student uh, that I had a student who prepare remarks. That was that was Niharika for him, luckily. She got in everything she wanted to say, despite my verbiage. So now, as much as I really want to say stuff here, uh, I'm going. Uh, I'm going right over to Patrick, who is uh, who has uh, prepared to be the discussant, talk with you all, maybe try to draw everybody else in. So take it away, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, we can hear. You. So uh, thank you for uh, your contribution and your talk uh, this afternoon. Well, uh, for us, it's afternoon in Germany, <laughs> but um, it was really, really insightful. And it was really interesting to get, an, a, get a perspective um, into your work. And um, yeah, I really appreciated it and appreciated it. And I guess we all did uh, that you um, make such a well thought out case for um, basic income experiments and also do these experiments in the United States and provide uh, the research community with uh, such a large amount of data. Um, I do have some questions or thoughts for you um, and maybe also the audience if someone would like to chime in, I'm, I don't know. Um, first thing I would like to ask you is that uh, you said that um, UBI experiments can frame UBI more positively in the eyes of participants and also reduce stigma as well as the notion of deserved and undeserved. Um, however, if we actually think about 
uh, possible UBI policy implementation, there will always be net recipients and net payers. Um, so, and in the experiments, there are in a sense, mostly only recipients. So do you really think we can confidently predict that stigma will be reduced or would it in a sense just be shifted? I mean, you also touched on this in your presentation, but I would be really interested interested in if you think we can actually confidently predict this from experiments. Oh, I say, should you, I have an immediate thought of this. I don't know if you had something specifically you wanted to address. I don't have an empirical thought about this, but go ahead, you go first. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that's really fantastic um, underneath Stacia's leadership, uh, the brilliance of the way that she employs baselines um, really lends itself to answering this question. So one of the things that we've been sort of embedding in all of our baseline um, data are open-ended questions around um, deservedness and sort of like ideas around how they think people will spend the money. And so we're in the process of actively coding those. And what I can tell you sort of early on, and this is, I'm not saying anything that's like cat out of the bag, it's been presented at two academic conferences thus far, it's just not in publication yet, um, is that the, there, there's a difference, and I'm taught, so the baseline survey, just to be clear, um, they're filled out not just by people who end up in treatment or control, but they're filled out by anybody who's applying to potentially be part of the treatment condition, okay? So we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans who are answering these open-ended questions around, around deservedness and spending. And one of the things that we're seeing is that the, the moral architecture, and I'm choosing that word intentionally, that people are attaching to the ideas of unconditional cash are fundamentally different than the ones that we see them attached to ideas around the safety net. So um, does that prove that it will shift, Patrick? I, I don't know, but what I can tell you with a lot of confidence knowing where we're at with that data is that there is something fundamentally different about the way that people view unconditional cash. It's just viewed through a different frame and it does not seem to have the same level of stigma. I think David Kelnitsky has a great paper, um, you know, articulating some of why this might be, um, and we'll see if it holds, right? But so far, what we can see is that there does seem to be a little bit of a difference, and some of that might be the pandemic, just to be fair. Um, but yeah, it's rare in your career that you get the chance to code thousands of qualitative responses, so that's why I get so excited about it. I think my thoughts on this are a little bit more historical and uh, racialized in the context of the pandemic. So if we look at the stimulus payments as well as pandemic unemployment assistance as proxies for guaranteed income or UBI in the U.S. So when there are three sets of stimulus payments that are rolled out right over the course of the pandemic um, and in one of, uh, well, the Bush administration did this as well, but went to higher income Americans, right, which because of the racialized nature of poverty, right, then we have much more white people that are receiving a government handout for maybe the first time, maybe the second time if, you know, they received the Bush ones as well. Um, so that's going to everyone. Everyone's really happy about their $1,200 or, or whatever it is. And there's not a lot of sort of public pushback that is racialized around receipt of that government handout in the same way that we see with safety net. However, as the pandemic kind of extends, right? There's this potential of extending pandemic unemployment assistance that is offered to individuals who are have lost their jobs due to the pandemic, which of course impacted those that are primarily concentrated in the service sector, which then means we're talking largely about, about Black women, right? So we then see the same welfare queen stigma attached to pandemic unemployment assistance um, that was not there before. And so because of that, I can't deny, right, that there's this racialized context that we operate in and the ways in which the stigma will be perceived will be within that uh, with UBI or guaranteed income either way. Yeah, thank you for your answer. That was actually really interesting also for me to get um, this uh, United States perspective that we often don't have in Europe and also like the, um, the racially charged um, discussion around it. This is, um, I mean, we do have it to some extent here in Germany as well, but it's not, not as much as in the US, of course. Um, I would like to pose another question that 
touches upon what you just said um, at the end of your presentation. You said you're not going to change the hearts and minds of people with data, but also you still are releasing your data, of course, and you want to make it publicly known so people can make up their mind and um, also maybe change perspective on um, yeah cash benefits or um, basic income. But is there any specific way you are communicating the data or publishing the data in a more digestible way for a broad or general audience? Because of course, data is to some extent digestible for researchers, but if you really want to get to the hearts and minds of a broad base of people, you maybe should, I think it would be a good approach to present the data in a very digestible way. So it's not uh, in danger of being misinterpreted or misunderstood. So do you have any plans for that or is it um, in the work? So. I'll add a little bit of context to my comment about data doesn't change hearts and minds. And that's a hard thing for me to swallow because I am very much the, the quantitative, like let's, if we just have the data, we can totally fix all the problems in the US and over the course of my career. And I think uh, we're all very naive in this, that doesn't work, right? So a legislator goes to their assistant and says, find me data that supports my argument, right? And that's, that's how uh, the, the decisions are made. They don't say, I'm really curious about does guaranteed income actually work or is UBI a good idea? Go find me all the research. No, it's a, it's a moral and values-based judgment for most legislators in, in the U.S. But um, that doesn't mean that we should not have some sort of empirical data that can help build the argument. If the data are positive, right, it's our job to put them out there. If the data are negative, it is our job to put them out there, understanding that legislators may pick and choose how they use the data. So that's kind of the one, that's the audience of uh, people that are gonna pick up a white paper, right, or, or pick up a small report. But then there's also sort of the media and the, the wider public. And so Dr. Castro, can you share a little bit about the plans for that? Yeah. So, I mean, what we know is that when we think historically in the U.S. and other countries, this applies as well, is that anytime we have a shift in the safety net or sort of, I would say, I would maybe say like a, a human dignity shift within the social contract, um, we typically have two things that are happening is that you've got sort of some type of a consensus that's taking place within the data as to how do you actually answer a question, right, around how would you construct a new piece of legislation. But then you also have um, a real shift in public discourse and a fracturing um, that people are willing to talk about and engage with a topic in a way that they maybe they didn't prior, right? So part of the way that we're doing this is, of course, the releasing spending data um, in the aggregate, but then also, you know, working around data visualization. So that's primarily happening through Juliana B. DeNere's lab at Stanford. Um, we'll be releasing that over the summer and thinking about ways that we are pairing narrative data alongside some of our traditional quantitative um, outcomes so that people have some context to understand what it is, right? Because as scientists, we tell absolutely terrible stories and then we wonder why, you know, COVID is rampant and people won't wear masks and like all of these things. And it's like, it'd be, just giving information is not enough. And so we know we have to capture people's imagination, um, but also that we know that if we wanna shift the narrative, we have to sort of shift who the narrator may be. And in that case, it involves handing over some of some of the framing to the community. So across the country right now, um, we're actually actively working with community organizers, um, and these are everyday people, not you know graduate students, for instance, who work with us around framing our data and work with us around saying, hey, you maybe you should frame this this way on the website and not this way, because here has here's how it's going to be interpreted by my community, or here's how this does or does not reflect our values or our personhood. Uh, and I think that that's really key when we're thinking about a human centric approach. Um, to research, but also policy design. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, that was a good, nice, great answer. Um, and uh, yeah, also really, it's, I think also think it's really important to, to frame the data in a way, this is why I asked. And if there is no one else having an immediate question, I would like to ask a last question um okay yeah we can go we can go to your your last question first i do have one in the queue but let's 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 do yours next okay so you 
In the beginning of your presentation, you um, mentioned that you put a lot of focus um, on the study of individual effects um, of um, basic income. And But do you think that studying these effects extensively, which you do, is also going to shed some light on community effects because our feedback effects from the community since they also seem to be still a very gray area in empirical UBI research. So in other words, do you think there is any way to infer some kind of community or feedback effects from all the individual effects you are um, you're looking at? So our largest study has 3,000 people in treatment and 4,800 people in control. Because we are directed in many of our sampling decisions by, uh, in this case, it was a municipal government, the sampling is completely across a range of zip codes, right? Uh, completely across the city of LA. And so the ability to pick up community effects, right? So I would think about things like better educational outcomes, reductions in hospitalizations or incarceration. Um, are simply we cannot pick them up because of the geographic dispersion that we have. But where we do not have strength in that uh, quantitatively, I think we do have the ability to say some things uh, qualitatively. Um, and I think that's a lot around networking, Amy. Yeah, I think there's, oh my goodness, there's so many ways that we're looking at this that I almost, <laughs> I want to tell them all. So I'm trying to decide what, how to think about it. I think probably what's most salient is thinking about pooling. So, you know, I, important thing to know is that in each of the experiments that we're working in right now, the recipient is an individual, right? Um, and so there are obvious research questions around that when we think about how is money pooled or not pooled. Uh, and so one of the things that we've seen so far is that when you are calming income volatility for that one individual in that one household, we do see spillover effects within their social network. So, you know, an age old question within the United States is how do poor folks get by when there's literally not enough money for them to do so, either because of what they're making, their wages being too low, or because of them not receiving enough from the safety net. And we know that one of the ways people get by is by pooling together resources, both kind, you know, kind, in kind, cash, not cash. Time is obviously a big component of this. And what we've seen is that as we see one household stabilize, it does tend to spill over into other spaces. Um, it's a real open question for us, like what the breaking point is there, right? And we're also trying to avoid this, creating this narrative that, um, you know, poor folks are resilient. They're just stretching their resources. They're just fine. Let's not change the fact that people don't have a living wage, right? And so it's really thinking about how do we ride this line of thinking about the fragility of networks alongside ideas around resilience and, you know, human agency and self-determination that is some of the needle that we're trying to thread. One last thought. I would just also hypothesize that the problems of social, racial, inequality in the US are so deeply entrenched that we have to be careful to not overstate the power of cash um, to, to impact something like mass incarceration or right or the, the lack of affordable housing. Um, so I want to see an experiment that picks up community level effects, but I think we would have to hedge those hypotheses knowing how deeply intractable those, those social problems feel. Oh, you know, we forgot neglected to mention too is that in some of our sites, we're going to be able to work with administrative data. So do you want to say a bit about that, Stacia? Because it Sure. So we can it. link to sort of government or administrative data at the federal and the state level. So for example, in, in two of our studies, um, we're looking at the effects of guaranteed income on reincarceration. Um, so that is pulling actual uh, jail and prison records from the local jurisdiction as well. Um, for, for the federal government. So there's some ability, I think, to look a bit beyond, right, just um, what that individual impact is and have something to speak to, but not to such uh, extent that I would say, wow, we picked up a community effect. I would be remiss to not mention Jane Family Institute's study uh, in Brazil, which actually is focused on a local currency um, and includes uh, enough, a large enough sample to be representative of an entire community um, and so that's a very cool study that people should check out. 
Okay, thanks. I don't All have right. any more questions. Um, yeah, I'm excited for the research you're going to put out, and I'm definitely going to read it. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Patrick. All right, now I have uh, <clears throat> another question uh, that comes from our YouTube audience, um, but, <clears throat> but it's by uh, it's by Brew Lane, who you you might know. Uh, Brew, if you're still watching, uh, and I I have that quote of yours that I quote all the time. Which is he talks about what one thing he talks about the one thing we find in every experiment is this is not his comment it's just I'm introducing the guy who made this asked this question um, that one thing we find is what he calls a residual effect since we know uh, since we know that the lack of money causes a severe economic deprivation causes so many problems we know over and over again we're going to see by almost any measure of welfare, plus specific things such as health, mental health, education, so forth, you're going to see across the board improvements in all these things. He calls these the residual effect. And what I always quote him when I say this is that this is something we can, this is something that experiments can do for, can do for the movement, even though, uh, even though maybe it doesn't be, need to be prove, proven over and over again that it has these effects. Um, but if you, if you, uh, in the, but there's no limit to how many people need to be told this and to remain reminded about it in every way. And I love the way you put it. I always say the disadvantage and you, you put, you say uh, or the disadvantage of the centers and you say the people who've experienced the worst capitalism has to offer, great way to put it. And there's a lot of different variations you get on that, the market economy, our society, our, whatever, our institutions, the worst they had to offer. And remind people that, yes, there are people who, there are people who can't pay their heat and, 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 uh, and, and, and resort to, to begging and eating out of dumpsters and so forth um, and work two jobs and still live in poverty. Um, reminding them of that and showing them, yes, there are people like this, it helps them. I think that's that's great connecting what you were saying, what 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 he's saying that these experiments can reliably do. But anyway, here's his question. Uh, if I've got this right, so he asked, um, uh, are um, are pilot experiments justified because they gather info on how visual how individuals may respond to an eventual UBI, or are they justified because they gather, in quotation marks, institutional information? Uh, for example, how UBI might function along with other policies. How does it fit into the actual institutional system, et cetera? I mean, obviously you could justify it in both ways, but um, how are you seeing what you're doing? I think is his question. He can't unfortunately respond. I agree. Um, thank you for the question. I don't think you can uh, disentangle those two things and say that they are justified uh, separately, simply because, you know, the, the institution has so many effects uh, on our personal lives, right? So the institution, such as I'll say HUD, for example, right, that institution that has a long history of retrenchment of federal funding then causes this or contributes to a housing shortage or a shortage of, shortage of available housing in the US. You then have the individual effect of having substandard uh, housing that impacts your entire family and your children. Um, so to me, I think the case that we're trying to make here uh, is, is a bit of both and, and investigating what are the pathways that we need to have in place. And I'll be very specific about that what are the waivers that we have to have in place so that we can protect people's benefits and have a cash plus sort of option, right? So we protect the, the right, or, or, or sorry, housing vouchers. We protect SNAP or food stamps. We protect Medicaid, Medicare. Um, and then in addition to that, because we know the individuals that have those social safety net supports, as Dr. Castro mentioned, uh, experience the worst that capitalism has to offer, right? So we target into that. Um, and then we top them up, give them an income floor, um, ideally for a lifetime, perhaps just for 12 months. 
Yeah, one thing um, I just want to add to that that I think I, we neglected to say during our presentation, so the question's prompting me to, is reminding me of it, is it, it's, it's about the individual, but it's also what the individual is demanding of institutions that have power and control over their life, right? So asking the question, you know, does the infusion of cash, because someone's in an experiment, for instance, cause them to demand better working conditions, cause them to demand um, more from their employer um, that they should have, right? Not just in terms of wages, but, but how they experience work and American life. And it's a really open question. And I think when we're not sort of interrogating that and connecting that um, with the ideas of why it is we're doing what we're doing, we're really remiss. And we're missing out the ways that we can connect the advocacy and organizing around guaranteed income or unconditional cash or UBI, choose your label, with all the other movement spaces that carry a really long and, and really strong legacy in the United States. And knowing that we can't operate within isolation, it has to, we have to be thinking about policy pairing and we have to be thinking about momentum at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, I, uh, and now I guess, now, now it sort of is my turn. Um, I've, been, I've been talking with, with uh, Michael Bohmeyer all day. This is our, if you're still on there, Michael, um, this, is, this is our, actually our third uh, UBI <laughs> seminar of the day. I, I'm in Berlin, so I, I, was, I, I visited my Grundein moment. It's a big office of like 30 some people working there. Um, and uh, there he is. Okay, and uh, and we now I find uh, that your your this I this idea you have about challenging narratives. As you know, this is the kind of thing I do. I do it in in a different way. I'm doing it. I'm doing it with the philosophers and the political theorists who are, uh, I believe, twisting some of them. Some even the very some of the very well-meaning ones. They're trying to twist their policies in order to get it to fit in with this rhetoric that everybody has to contribute while we pull our, our uh, turn a blind eye to how powerless this makes the poor against the rich who don't have this reciprocal obligation to contribute. And then these people being end up being experiencing the worst capitalism has to offer and, and, and trying to create a system that, that does everything but challenge that. Now, what, what, uh, one of the things that Mikhail, Mikhail and, I, and I were trying to, we're, we're talking about was the German program uh, is not so much trying to challenge that, that narrative. Um, it's, it, it, it's you know, McCar obviously they're aware of it, object to it, but, um, but, but there, the idea of changing that big narrative in maybe uh, uh, is something that I don't think they can do right now. And he asked me, well, okay, I realize, he's like, I know, Carl, your idea is the best defense is good offense. But if that's not what we're doing, how do we defend ourselves in Texas? And I've really never thought of that before. How do we? So I'd like to relay his question to me, to you two, but also I'd like to consider some thoughts like, why? Why is it different? In why is it different in Germany than the United States? Is it, uh, is it do more people actually feel brought in in Germany, or uh, are the um, uh, or is like the, the Turkish minority uh, has a very different history than the, the, the which is the biggest uh, which is the biggest uh, minority in Germany? If I got that right, at least the, at the low end. Um, and uh, is it because the Turkish minorities narrative is so, uh, history is so different than uh, the, the, the black and native uh, uh, and other uh, um, outgroups in the United States? It, could that be the reason? It's because their, their, their Bismarckian system has, has, uh, is, has been, has a history of greater gener generousness in the United States, so it's brought more people in. I would like to discuss all those issues. And so I don't even have a focused question. Uh, Michael, do you want to go first, or do, you, do all, the rest of y'all want to go first? No. I don't know enough about <laughs> how racism is codified in the German welfare state, but that's all we do in the U.S., right? And I, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, to me, it's a question of, I, like, okay, so if I'm thinking about this as as a theorist, right, through the lens of social theory. Um, we know that in every context, there's an outgroup, 
right? And there's usually a multiplicity mm-hmm. of outgroups. And so yeah. when we think about deservedness narratives and these binaries about who's considered deserving of human rights and who is not, right? That's going to shift based on social location. Um, and so in our context, it's an incredibly racialized narrative. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to know, you know, what it is for Germany, but I would argue that when we're thinking about trying to dismantle um, some of these ideas around deservedness that are, I mean, these things go back, right? This is part of the human experiment ex- experience for, for good or for ill is that we divide into groups. Yeah. This is what we do. I mean, Marx has an awful lot to say about this, right? Um, and figuring out what those narratives are based on your context, to me, is something that um, the conversation around UBI or guaranteeing income demands of us. So to me, it's a really ethical obligation as a researcher. And in my location, it really takes a very racialized lens because of the way that the U.S. operates. Um, But I would be really surprised if there was a context somewhere on the globe where there wasn't a similar or a different narrative that needed to be addressed in order to actually implement um, guaranteed income or UBI, which is inherently tied to a, a, the idea of human rights and human dignity. Like that's really what we're talking about here. And there's something blocking the path to that in every location. There's just obviously degrees of freedom that shift. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, that might be too heady of a way of putting it, but I know of no sh- social theorists that would argue that we don't have these ad- deservedness binaries existing all over the planet. Um, uh, okay. Uh, if, if nobody else wants to, uh, one thing that somebody I was talking to, talking to just the other day, whose n- name is slipping my mind right now, uh, he's a, a German researcher, has written stuff on basic income, so I shouldn't be forgetting his name. Um, but he was saying that, that, um, that the, the, the German system is, is so in trend, the thinking he thinks is more entrenched in the United States, despite the fact that we have we have gerrymandering the Senate and the and the <laughs> and the Supreme Court, yeah. all of which slow down change. Those don't uh, those don't necessarily slow down change in, in the rhetoric. The rhetoric might change faster because we have people like policy entrepreneurs. You can just run in the primaries and like, oh, I'm you know, like Andrew Yang, oh, I'm running on basic income, but you also get people really challenging. Uh, challenging a lot of narratives uh, in a way that he doesn't think they do with the, the parla- with an entrenched parliamentary system and something that has brought a lot of people off, brought a lot of people in that he thinks it's actually slow to change things. That might be one thing that explains the difference in the German and, and the American context. It's even if it's hopeless to get things changed in the United States with the rules, it is, it is maybe. I don't know. I don't know enough about Germany, but the guy I was talking to who does thinks it's maybe maybe easier to change the rhetoric in the United States. I don't know. I, I have a question, actually. So, as I understand the German experiment, um, it is to it's it's not a both and right. You must choose either the guaranteed income and and then or the UBI and give up any other social supports. Is that the case? Yes, that's the case. Mm-hmm. So if we advocated that in the U.S., they would be like, yeah, totally. Take down, take down the welfare state. Um, <laughs> kick all of those people off of TANF. I think that may be part of it is that in the U.S., in this movement, we very much say like we are for cash and all of these other things. Um, most of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it, that's a, such a good point, Stacia. And I, thinking about just the ways that that, how do I put this? Sometimes when I'm talking with the press, you know, I can get this question of, you know, why now, right? And and why is this an issue now? Um, it's not like this came out of left field. And one of the things I often say is like, I've been working in the area of social justice for many years. And this is the first thing where I've seen such momentum around the right and the left, right? Disparate political orientations within the United States. And on the one hand, that's a tremendous strength, right? So that gives me the, a wedge that I can kind of crack open these political and, and you know policy windows to try and push something through. But on the other hand, that coalition building can also be used as a weapon to eliminate programs that we still need. 
Um, so in our context, you know, exactly what Stacia was just talking about, you know, if we were to sort of come out swinging saying, yeah, let's eliminate HUD and Obamacare and food stamps and every other benefit in place of guaranteed income, we would have rabid support from Trump voters. I'm, con- I'm convinced of it, right? Um, but that's sort of the risk that we run when we're working with the public. But I think we, it also kind of demands it. And it's why we, you kind of have to have your hand on both things at the same time. Um, because once the data is out there in the world, you don't know how it will or will not be weaponized. And it, sort of having to think about it through both of those lenses at the same time. So I don't know what that means for Europe, um, and I'd be certainly curious to know how these themes play out um, in other people's contexts as well. I'm going to have to go. Thank you very much, guys. All right. All right. Thanks, nice um, to sorry you. we couldn't get you in sooner there, Michael. Uh, yeah, I think, I think both, approaches, both approaches are really, really good and important. I, one of the things I wanted to get you, I kind of brought this up in general, what advice do you have for him, and hopefully somebody from his project is still watching, uh, or I can relate to him next time I, I see him. Uh, it was really a fascinating question when he asked me this. Okay, Carl, if you weren't playing the strategy that the best defense is a good audit, uh, offense, uh, the best, how would you play this? How would you play this? of you, when people are making this criticism, how would you respond to them? I, and one, one thing I told him, I won't tell you everything I told him so he gets a minute, minute left, but I wouldn't do what the Stockton mayor did when Seed came out and proclaimed to high heavens how wonderful it was that, uh, that people, uh, people did not work any less. Um, that's t- a little too much buy-in for me. But if you were playing defense on this, uh, for the contextual reasons why they, they, they need to do this in Germany or they feel like, you know, they feel like, uh, that, that that's their role in Germany. Um, what, what did you, can you think of advice? It took me like an hour and then I had some, but it, it, what, what's yours? Stacia, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Yeah. I mean, gosh, I, the, the biggest thing is that you know, we're, we're trained as scientists. And if you're a policy entrepreneur or policymaker, you're trained to think in a particular way. And you are not just trained to think in a particular way, you're rewarded by staying with like-minded people. So, you know, Penn is never going to incentivize me to leave the walls of Penn and go and sit with community members and actually ask these questions in a hard way with people who don't have rights or with people who don't have political power or money, right? And so if, whether you're playing offense or defense, right? the first step is always having the discipline and the commitment to spending the time to listen to people. And I mean, it takes forever, honestly, and it's a pain in the butt. Like, oh my God, I'll be honest. It's the most rewarding part of my job and also the most difficult um, because it allows me to open myself, it, it forces me to open myself up to criticism um, from community members who have serious questions um, to ask, not just of research, but Um, of American democracy in general. And I think that that's true regardless of context is that having the discipline to get outside of your bubble um, and spend time listening to what those core concerns are and objections may be is always going to be the first step regardless of what your orientation is from a research perspective or a methods perspective, right? Even if you're running a pure RCT, what research question you're starting with and what your sampling frame is, I think in this context can and should be driven by what those objections may be with the public. Um, and that's certainly an approach that we've taken up um, to a certain degree, sometimes with, with mixed impact or mixed success. Um, but I don't know what you want to add to that, Stacia. Mine's a little bit more of a philosophical and communications take, which I think is that I do not spend a lot of time if I'm playing offense. I do not spend a lot of time espousing the virtues of the poor. I spend more time criticizing the lack of morality of the rich. And truly, if we're constantly speaking to, oh, they know how to spend the money. Oh, you know, they get more jobs, these sorts of things. We center the problem in poor people themselves rather than centering it on rich people. So often, you know, we get the question, oh, wasn't it surprising that 47% of the money was spent on food? No, that wasn't surprising at all. Um, Wasn't it surprising that like only 1% was spent on drugs and alcohol? And I say, no one asked the rich what they spend their dividends on. I bet they spend a lot on drugs and alcohol by comparison. 
and a lot yeah. more on going out to eat. So yeah. these are the things that I just like to reframe. Let's not mm-hmm. talk about the virtues yeah. of the poor. Let's talk about yeah. the lack of virtue in our economic structures. Yeah, yeah, I said the very thing today at, at, at a one o'clock seminar, the very same thing about nobody asks how people sell their stock dividends, you know. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of that goes right up people's noses or so I've heard. Um, <laughs> I uh, would be wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I just, it's just like big narratives do change. Um, it, 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 it's, uh, it's um, you know, queer narratives have changed so much. If, if, in, if in 1968, you said, what's more, you know, which is going to happen faster, guaranteed income or, or, or uh, same sex marriage, um, people would have said, oh, we should get guaranteed income next year, but same sex marriage, that's like a thousand years off or something, you know? <laughs> um, and they were, were totally wrong. And also, but also, you know, big changes in, in, in racial narrative between, between the 40s and the 70s. And now uh, uh, we're on the cusp of changing back with all this white nationalist mm-hmm. uh, stuff that's going on, white identity politics. Um, okay. Um, I have a quite, oh, oh, it's, I'm sorry. It's noon where you are. I've got another question. You can um, go with one more question. Okay, <laughs> I am going to okay. pop off. She, um, I can hang for I one do. more question. She's yeah. going to step out. Okay. Yeah. Great okay. to see you all. Thank you, Carl. Okay, great. Um, okay. You too. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. So excited here. Okay. Here's a question. It, it is from Maria Sanchi. Um, and it says, Following on from the question about the individual focus of the aggregate data, I am involved in a study slash pilot that is community focused and specifically looking at community networks, resourcing and agency. Mm -hmm. Do you have any such studies within your data set? Uh, If not, why do you think that is? Such studies, wait, say the last part of that one more time so I understand. Okay. I'm involved in a study pilot that is community focused and specifically looking at community networks, resourcing and agency. Do you have any such studies within your data set? And if not, why do you think that is? Uh, I mean, in terms of, as a sort of an object of inquiry, all three of those categories are covered in all of our experiments, um, is that we're constantly looking at, I mean, agency is a driving core piece. Uh, but then you can't think about agency absent network or absent community sort of cohesion. So it's a pretty big component of what we're looking at. It's just something that you won't see published yet, quite yet. Although there are some in the first Stockton report, there's a little bit of data that we present there. Um, but sort of forthcoming in peer review is what I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, great. Okay, we've kept you over time. Thanks for the extra couple okay. of minutes. Uh, it's been a really fun day for me with just talking about this stuff for now, like what, three and a half hours for me. And, um, it's a long time. And, and Michael and a couple others. So uh, not all in a row, but, uh, yeah. but great. And uh, yeah, I look forward, forward to uh, hearing a lot more and talking to you a lot more about this project. And it's, it's, it's just all this good news is going to be bleeding out for, for the next like Oh, what seven to ten years, or at least. So, hopefully, yeah. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I think the one advantage of COVID is that it has allowed us to to be much more comfortable in these virtual environments and interact with people that we wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. They're really expensive um, plane flights. So, thank you so much yeah. for creating this space for it. Yeah, and I add a disclaimer oh. that we're all trying to be. We're all people who are. Most of the people running these experiments are people who are committed to UBI. Yeah, uh, already are believers in it. Uh, that are some form of guaranteed income. But we're also we're, we're all trying to be good scientists at the same time. That's a difficult yes. balance. <laughs> it acts, but it also it solves some of the problems that you get if you just hire some neutral person. Very mm-hmm. often you get a much bigger you get a much bigger streetlight effect where you just shine the light on whatever the difference between the control and this con- experimental group is. Whatever that is, we look at that and we don't look at how that fits into any narratives, what it really says about UBI. So, um, you know, as much as I'm you know, enthusiastic for good news, I also want, you know, more than yeah, anything. I want yeah, to- exactly. We need a full picture. But yeah, thank you yeah. so much. It's been great to speak you with too. everybody. See you later, Amy. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Everybody else, so long. And um, we are off next week because I'm giving another talk that day. Um, 
And so uh, we're back in two weeks and uh, check the schedule.